Welcome to this video on renewable energy resources. I'm Aida Awad from Broward College. Our learning targets for this video will be to describe the differences between renewable and non-renewable sources of energy and recognize examples of each, to calculate how long non-renewable fuels will last under a variety of different consumption rates, to describe environmental consequences caused by exploiting different forms of energy, and to discuss how transition to renewable forms of energy will help reduce the threat of global warming. Start off with talking about energy consumption. Global energy consumption has been increasing over time. The biggest increases recently have been in India and China. The per capita consumption of energy is higher in developed than in developing countries, and developed nations use more, but consumption in those developed nations is relatively stable. The world's energy requirements will continue to increase as population continues to increase. In the diagram here that comes from the EIA, we can see world energy consumption by source from 1990 through about 2012, and then projections on through 2040. And you'll notice that the trends for liquid fuels tend to be rather consistently increasing. The trends for coal increased dramatically from about 2002 through 2008 and have started to flatten out after that, being overtaken by natural gas. Renewable energy had an uptick around 2008, and nuclear power has been rather stable the entire time. We'll first talk about coal as a renewable energy resource. Coal is in fact the most abundant fossil fuel on Earth. It's used to produce electricity and steel. Burning coal releases more air pollutants than oil or natural gas. In fact, about a third of all airborne mercury is released through coal power plants. And burning coal produces sulfur and nitrogen oxides, which react with water vapor and produce acid rains. Consumption of coal has surged in recent years in India and China. So let's take a look at this bottom diagram first. In this bottom diagram, which comes from the EIA, we can see the world carbon dioxide emissions from coal use in millions of metric tons over time from 2008 projected out through 2035. The top line with the diamond shapes on it is for China. You can see a dramatic increase. The middle line here trending relatively flat with the squares is the United States. And then the triangles on this line that's increasing slightly over time is for India. In the top right corner diagram, we can see the global share of recoverable coal reserves. You'll note that the United States has about 28%, Russia 18%, China 13, the rest of the world 20, and lesser amounts for Australia, India, and Germany. Coal mining has significant environmental impacts. Surface mining of coal within 30 meters of the surface, about 60% of U.S. coal is mined in this way, and about 40% of the remaining is mined as subsurface mining. One of the major problems with surface mining of coal in the United States is removal of an entire mountaintop. As an example, about 15 to 25 percent of the mountains in southern West Virginia have had their peaks removed uh, or will have them removed by about 2020. Additional problems come from the fact that the valleys and the streams are being filled in with tailings and debris. This is also a problem in Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Virginia. Some other environmental impacts of coal are that acid and toxic mineral drainage leaches from mine waste, including sulfuric acid and dissolved materials such as lead, arsenic, and cadmium. And those can wash into lakes and streams, as we see in the picture on the top left. Scrubbers have been installed to remove sulfur and particulates from the emissions that are released during coal burning. And those scrubbers, chemicals react with exhaust from the coal and precipitate out the polluting emissions. An additional solution that we found is to use a fluidized bed combustion process for coal, where the crushed coal is mixed with limestone to neutralize acidic compounds and produce additional heat and produce fewer nitrogen oxides and remove sulfur. In the top right map here, you can see for the United States, sulfur emissions by coal plant in the year 2010. And you'll see that the size of the circle, the larger the circle, the greater the amount of emissions, the smaller the circle, the lesser the amount of emissions. Moving on now to talk about oil and natural gas. 
56% of the United States and globally energy comes from oil and natural gas. Natural gas comes in the form of methane, ethane, propane, and butane, and methane is primarily used for heating buildings and for electricity generation. In terms of transportation fuels for cars, trucks, and buses, the environmental advantages of natural gas over gasoline and diesel are that there are 33% less carbon dioxide emissions, 80 to 93% fewer hydrocarbons overall, 70% less carbon monoxide, 90% fewer toxic emissions, and almost no soot. And in 2015, 23 million natural gas vehicles worldwide were in use, about half of which were in China, Iran, and Pakistan. In this diagram, we can see a picture of the petroleum refining process, and that's done through a fractionation tower. In a fractionation tower, liquids composed of hundreds of hydrocarbon compounds are refined to separate the crude oil into its different products based on their boiling points. And this also separates out things that are used in petrochemicals, um, as oil is used to produce fertilizers, plastics, paints, pesticides, medicines, and synthetic fibers. If you'd like to take a look at the fractionation tower, please pause the video and look through each step. Oil and natural gas resources. There are major oil fields in the Middle East, Russia, the United States, Venezuela, Mexico, Kazakhstan, and Libya. Large oil deposits probably also exist under many of the continental shelves and in some deep water areas. Recently, hydraulic fracturing has become popular as a extraction method for extracting natural gas. It's difficult for scientists to predict how long supplies of oil and natural gas will last due to technological breakthroughs, new reserves being discovered, changes in consumption rates, but the optimistic predictions suggest that global oil production will peak around the year 2035, and that natural gas, which is a bit more plentiful, production will rise through 2045. As we know, oil and natural gas have serious environmental impacts. For oil, each gallon of gas that is burned releases nine kilograms of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It contributes to acid deposition and photochemical smog. Nitrogen oxides are also formed, but almost no sulfur oxides. Those come primarily from coal burning. For natural gas, it burns relatively cleanly with no sulfur and far less CO2. Almost no particulate matter is released compared to oil and coal. There are risks, of course, associated with the transport, including leaks and spills. In the images on this slide, you see the Deepwater Horizon fire. In the middle picture, you can see what oil from one of those oil spills actually looks like in the ocean. And in the bottom picture, you see a recent spill that occurred in the Midwest portion of the United States that was on the Keystone Pipeline. Moving on to talking about generating less electricity through nuclear energy. When uranium is mined, it contains three different isotopes, uranium-238, 235, and 234. In order to develop fuel from those ores, we need to refine the uranium to increase the concentration of uranium-235 from about 1% to about the 4% that's required for use in reactors. And that requires a great deal of energy. In the process, the uranium ore is processed into pellets with each pellet containing the energy equivalent of about one ton of coal or three barrels of oil or 481 cubic meters of natural gas. Those pellets are then placed into fuel rods and about 200 fuel rods are assembled together into a fuel assembly. Reactors typically contain about 150 to 250 fuel assemblies and each one lasts about three years. Energy is released by fission or fusion in nuclear reactions. A fission reaction takes place when nuclei split into two smaller fragments that are accompanied by the release of large amounts of energy in the form of heat. You can see in the diagram here that a neutron impacts a uranium-235 atom, which causes that fission reaction to take place. Fusion is when two small atoms are combined to form a large atom of a different element, and that's the process that powers the sun and stars. In conventional nuclear fission, we use fuel assemblies, such as shown in this top picture, in a nuclear reactor, where there's a controlled nuclear fission chain reaction that uses uranium-235 to produce energy in the form of heat. 
The heat is used to convert water into steam, and that steam drives a turbine, generating electricity. We have a lot of data about nuclear energy and comparisons to fossil fuels. A bit of that data comes from NASA. And it's interesting data because it compares the cumulative net greenhouse gas emissions that are prevented by using nuclear power in place of fossil fuels. In the graph panel on the left-hand side, we're just going to look at this top graph here. It's the historical data. And this is the cumulative prevented greenhouse gas emissions in gigatons of carbon dioxide. And what this diagram shows us is that about 64 gigatons of carbon dioxide worldwide have been saved by using nuclear power instead of fossil fuels. And that assumes that that power would have been created using fossil fuels had it not been created by nuclear energy. And you can see the breakdown for individual countries here. And the three diagrams on the right side show that cumulative net deaths have been prevented, assuming that nuclear power replaced fossil fuels. Again, we'll just look at the historical data here. And this suggests that worldwide, about 1.8 million deaths have been prevented by using nuclear power instead of fossil fuels. And the prevention there was because of people not breathing those fossil fuel emissions. An additional concern with nuclear power is the storage of the waste. High levels of nuclear waste include fuel rods, fuel assemblies, and other nuclear power plant waste. A power plant typically produces about 30 tons of spent fuel per year. However, a typical coal plant produces about 300,000 tons of coal ash per year. That high-level nuclear waste is difficult to store, it's toxic, and it produces considerable amounts of heat for many years. It must be stored securely for thousands of years, and the best solution that's been identified to date is to store it in a stable rock formation deep in the ground, a stable formation such as the Yucca Mountain facility that's being prepared in Nevada. Commercial power plants currently store spent fuel on site, but none of them are designed for long-term storage. The way they're currently being stored is shown in the picture at the top. On the left is a spent fuel pool. That's where those assemblies initially go. After about three months, it's lost about 50% of its radioactivity. After a year, 80%. After 10 years, it's lost about 90% of its radioactivity, and it can be moved to dry cask storage. However, it's important to remember that it does remain radioactive for thousands of years in the future. I think it's time to review our learning targets. We described the differences between renewable and non-renewable sources of energy. Hope you can recognize examples of those non-renewable sources. Looked at how long non-renewable fuels will last under a variety of different consumption rates. Described environmental consequences caused by exploiting different forms of non-renewable energies. And talked about transitioning to renewable forms of energy. In the next video, we'll talk about renewable energy. Go ahead and take your mastery check quiz and I'll see you in class.